Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Rosai to Islam. Akiki, introduce yourself, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Ahmed Idris. I'm half English, half Sudanese from West London, and I'm 20 years old. Rosai to Islam. It was a dream, but now, alhamdulillah, it's a reality. It's a reality. How long have you been Muslim for? Alhamdulillah, born Muslim. But um, I proper started practicing when I was about 18 years old. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Aki, can you tell us a little bit about your life before you started practicing the deen, inshallah? Right, basically, it sort of started a long time back when I was back in school. I was a little kid. And um, being raised in Labour Grove, you know, it's supposed to be a quite a rough area in West London. And when I went to school, um, I ended up enrolling in Holland Park Secondary School. Which, was, which had quite a reputation for being quite a hard, tough, rough school at the time. So um, I thought to myself, well, I'm probably in for quite a hard time now. So I went to the school anyway, sort of check it out, see what it was saying. So when I got in there, the first day, I walked in through the gates and I was a little kid and I didn't know what to expect. So as I was walking in, some massive kids, I don't know what, what year they were in, probably a 12, 6 form, something like that, they came straight past me and, and one held a metal bat and passed it to another one. I went, here we go. And I saw it in front of my eyes, he, he hit someone's elbow in, in front of me. And I thought, this is what I've got to live with for six years. So I thought, better chin up, chest out, and better do my thing. So that was when I was in year seven. So that as time went by, and time went by, and time went by, we started getting into our own madness. People started watching us. As we got older, the youth started coming in and watching us do strange things and fighting for no reason. And just basically, we used to just have fun. And um, it just kept going on like that. It was like a constant cycle. It was every day we'd just be like, go to school, mess around. Class was just another playground indoors. And then we didn't really concentrate very much. That's why I didn't really pass as much in school because we just spent our whole time playing around, messing around. And then when we got outside, it turned a bit more severe. Like whatever would happen inside the class, we'd deal with it outside in the playground. And then it moved outside the playground to outside of the school. Then outside of the school, it moved to the main roads. Then it moved from the main roads out into the areas that we lived in. So it was just started very small and it started gradually getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Then as the time went on, it wasn't enough to just fight and just have fun and do those things. As we got older, our fun became more, a bit more expensive, so we needed a bit more money. So then we looked for ways of making money. So then that's where you get surrounded by things like the drugs, like the robbing, like whatever it is, that you, whatever means we had to get money, we'll get money that way. It, doesn't matter. it didn't matter to us because we didn't really care. It was there at the time, so whatever. And um, some people say blame the parents, but I don't say blame the parents because you know what? A lot of the time the parents are good people, but it's the kids that are just they 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 they're gone off touch, and uh, I think it's a lot to do with your uh, friends and the kind of crowds you're getting involved with. Because inside our school, we'd have kids that would only spend their time in the library or in the music rooms because that was the kind of crowd that they were into. And then you get other kids that spend their time all, all in the sports pitches and sports sports gyms because that's what they were into. That's their crowd. But we, us lot, we had a crowd that liked to do that liked to fight and rob and steal and smoke and drink and all the rest of it. So that was what we was into. And that's why we got into that life, you know. That's why I say don't blame the parents, blame the kids, really, because it's them. Um, apart from that, when I left, when I left school, um, I went. I ended up going to Kingston College. That's where I got introduced to sort of more of the like. It was even worse than my school. I mean, that's where I got introduced to seeing guns actually in school, which we didn't get that in our school. It was all outside. But when we went there, we saw guns in school. When there was a fight happened. Someone will make one call and someone will be outside waiting with a gun after school. So it was like, it was slightly a bit harder, but it's, it didn't really phase us that much because we were we was kind of used to the kind of uh, hyped up mentality of the youth. So basically when we got there, I used to sort of come into school every day and just do, do what I do and just chill out with whoever I was chilling out with at the time, my, my clique, my crew, whatever. And then slowly, slowly I started seeing some brothers that used to come into the school every day and they used to wear like, and the imama and they used to wear whole books and this and I thought you know what that's a good look I kind of liked it and a couple of the, couple of guys there they were kind of respected so I thought you know I, I like the respect that's what we that's what we chase for so maybe I should sort of look to see what they're about 
So I see them every every day going at the back of the school somewhere, like in the, one of the back corridors. And I used to think to myself, let me find out what they're doing. So I used to go and sit near them, give salams and be like, what's going on? Try and listen to what they were saying. And then they would say, let's go for salah, it's time for salah now. So then they all go. And I realised, OK, these people are going to pray. So I thought, let me go with them and see what happens. So I went there and then slowly, slowly, I saw one come with a thobe. And I thought to myself, right, that's a good look as well. So I thought, let me put on a thobe. I came to school with a It felt good. But I didn't feel enough. I, you know, because you, all your life you've been trying to impress the people rather than trying to impress Allah. So you're trying to see what the other people are doing, so you want to do the same as them and better. So when I see them holding books, I thought, yeah, I've already got a thobe now. So I see them holding a book. I thought, that's a good look as well. So let me go buy a book. So I went and bought Kitab Tawheed. I didn't realize that the book one day would change my life. SubhanAllah, I bought that book and I went to school and I just hold it and walk around with it. And then I see them reading it like in, the, in, in, the, in the, the canteens. I thought, you know, I've got to get this book. And people, they were talking about the book and I didn't know anything about the book because I just used to hold it. So I thought, right, let, me go, let me go and have a look at this book. So I used to look at it. I see some of them highlighting. So I went and bought a pack of highlighters. I started highlighting, highlighting, highlighting. And you know what? SubhanAllah. Highlighting, you really need to know what you're reading to highlight. So I learned a lot from that book, SubhanAllah, and Kitab al-Tawheed is, I would say, that's probably the best book to start with because it's grounding your fundamentals. Tawheed, Tawheed, Tawheed. It has everything in that book, SubhanAllah. So yeah, we started reading that book and just it, it sort of gradually went from there, really, because after that, uh, I would know bits of the book, so people would be like, people that didn't know so much about the book would come and ask me questions and we sit down and discuss the book, discuss what we was doing uh, and then slowly start going to lessons and lectures and this and that until it just escalated until it was like I had realised after that from reading that book that things are not for the people, we have to do things for Allah because Riyah is shirk itself. So Alhamdulillah anyway. So I think the sort of the click that made me actually really practice properly was, you know, there's a saying from one of the Salaf that if you act in a certain way, eventually your heart will lead into that, into that way of, of, of living. So I think by, by sort of putting myself in a position where I was around those brothers and I wanted to be like those brothers and acting in a way that they were acting, which to me was, that was on Deen. And I liked it. So I wanted to act in that way. So I, st I did slowly start acting. Like I said, I started putting the phobe, I started holding the book and reading the book and whatnot. So by the time that I had done all that, when I actually got to the gritty point of reading and I actually gained an ilm, then I really understood it for myself rather than having to try and figure it out. The book itself showed me that, showed me, explained to me what Tawheed was in the first place anyway, because I didn't know what Tawheed was. When someone asked me, what's the three categories of Tawheed? I would have been dumbstruck, I'd be like, there's three categories of Tawheed. I thought Tawheed was one. But then we do have categories. We have Tawheed al-Isma al-Safat. We have Tawheed al-Uluhiyah and Rububiyah. So we have these things, that they, they were important factors to learn about because without them, you wouldn't really understand what Islam is about. You wouldn't understand what Allah, wouldn't understand his concepts. So then we started learning slowly about um, where Allah is and all these kind of aspects, which are much bigger, bigger um, topics than like just the dunya and whatnot, because our aqidah wasn't in place. If someone asks us something about Allah, where is Allah, we might say it, Allah is everywhere, because this is what we're taught in school. In school, you, in RE, they'll tell you Allah, uh, God, he's, he's everywhere, he's in and around creation and this. Well, now we know this is shirk. He's not in and around creation, he's above his throne. And then they ask you, okay, so you know he's above his throne, what's the hadith? Then you go home and you learn hadith and you come back. Then someone will ask you and you know it. So it's like, the gaining of the elm, the gaining of the elm every day, every day, every day was, is, is what sort of drives you deeper and deeper into the deen. Because at the end of the day, this is deen and nasiha, you have to give your advice to the people. And if you, if you can't give advice if you don't know yourself. So you get advice, then what you do is you go and you, t and, and you implement it. What's the three fundamental principles? Three fundamental principles is to gain, gain elm, then implement the elm. Then, uh, then, spread, then spread the ilm. So this is what we did. We took it. First of all, we learnt it. Then we implemented it in ourselves. And then after that, we went and pushed it to the people. So this is, this is the three fundamental principles that, we, that I based, my, based myself upon. So alhamdulillah, that's, that's what I did. And that's what pushed me into the deen further and further and further until I'm at the point where I'm now. Alhamdulillah, where the deen is 
obviously the most important thing to me and I've, I've learned a lot, a lot along the way and I've got a lot to learn still. What I know isn't even a drop in the ocean. So I'm like, people, people, some people, they see me and giving that word, they think, it's, they, they think I'm some sort of something bigger than I am anyway. And I want to remind the brothers that, you know, to be honest, me, myself, anyone can put on a front, but what's inside is important. And, you know, you, you might see somebody that he's, he's bigger than you or he's more or important than you or something like this, but it's not true. There's some people that you see them on the outside, they look like nothing, but inside they're, they're more, worth more than diamonds and gold. But there's some people that you see on the outside, they look like the best person in the world, but inside they're rotten like, a, like an old apple, you know? So it's important to sort of um, base, your, base your opinions of people upon the deen, not upon the dunya. So Aki, how did your family take to you when you started practicing the deen? To be honest, when I started practicing the deen, I mean, way back in the days, my parents have been trying to push me to pray, to fast, to, to, to love Allah and love the sunnah. But as, uh, as I came onto the deen fully, my parents actually started getting a bit worried because, you know, with, with all the kind of hype that happens at the moment and terrorism and all the rest of it, uh, you find that parents, they get worried for the kids when they start loving the sunnah because they, start, they think that they're going to start getting sucked into this sect or that sect and going astray. So um, when I started sticking hard to the sunnah and said to my parents, nah, it's haram to listen to music, nah, it's haram this and haram that, they started to get worried. They started thinking he's, he's going a bit hard. Um, so, I mean, I come from a background where my mum, she's come from like a, a Sufi line of Islam and my, my dad is, is from Sudan where there's a lot of Sufi and Alhamdulillah, but he loves the Sunnah. They both love the Sunnah, Alhamdulillah. But when they saw me, I, I came from a very sort of, um, you know, Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah. So it's like, we love the Sunnah and every bid'ah is, is a misguidance. But some of the olders, they don't quite, uh, they don't quite take it like that. They just like, they think to themselves, you know, this, these things are evolutions of Islam and these things are needed and they're alright, there's khair in them but I don't believe there's khair in them, I believe that the sunnah is the sunnah. So then the parent, my parents started getting a bit worried for me thinking that I was going into a hard, hard line type of stream of Islam and they were a bit worried in terms of me wearing tob to school and the kind of things that could happen to me with the police or security uh, services and stuff like this. But they realised after a time that I wasn't upon that kind of hard line Islam kind of attitude Rather, I was just trying to follow the sunnah the best I can and wearing the thobe was just a part of making this new identification for myself, this new way of life, trying to keep away from uh, dre like dressing to impress kind of thing, trying to humble myself rather than trying to look hard. I wasn't trying to look like a hardliner, I'm not trying to look like anything else. I was just trying to humble myself down to the point where people would look at me and not think like, you know, not think I'm trying to be arrogant or not trying to think I'm trying to be anything special. Rather just look at me and thinking he's just something in the corner. I just want, that's what I wanted. I wanted to be that person in the corner nobody looks at. So that's what it was all about. And um, subhanAllah, it's just like, I think a lot of the time that parents, they do get worried for their kids like that. But I think sometimes these days, the kids, they, they get a love for the sunnah. So they, they want to have that kind of uh, lifestyle where they see a lot of their friends now wearing tobe and this and that. And it's nothing, it's nothing more than just a love for that attire to look like a Muslim and I think parents, the oldest, they need to start, start realising that because they see that, you know, maybe back home in their countries, the people that wear the tobes and this and that, they kind of, maybe they are hardliners, I don't know what, but there's a, sort of like a stereotype and the parents, maybe they get worried because they love, because of the love for their kids. So I hope the, the parents and the elders out there can realise that the kids, if they, they love the sunnah, then push them to it. Push them towards it because if they really love the sunnah, then they ain't gonna go into hardline Islam because there's no hardline anything in this, in the sunnah itself, in the Quran and the sunnah. So if they if they do come with those things and they do come with strange kalam and strange talk, then bring them the sunnah. Don't bring them your kalam. Don't bring them your your your, your opinions. Bring them the sunnah. Say to them, look, this is what it says in the Quran and this is what you're saying. So that sheikh or that imam at the masjid says something and it's not quite in line with the sunnah or Quran. Say this is the sunnah and Quran because the, the kid will, will respect that more than you telling him no, straight, no, this and that, no, this and that. So if you, if you, you base your arguments with them according to the Quran and Sunnah, they will respect that and they will take that on more than, you, more than if you just told them to leave what they were upon, because they won't do it. So Aki, you see like your old school friends, the people that you used to be around, how do they see you now when they see you practicing the deen? 
I think Alhamdulillah Islam because it's because it's so common now in the streets and so common in it, like in and around us that when people see you come onto Deen they don't really think twice about it, they don't really think it's a strange thing. They just see that it's it's something that uh, that a lot of people are getting onto. So they're quite used to it now. You know, if they see you with Tob, they're not quite Maybe back in the days they might be embarrassed to see you in Tob and might be embarrassed to stand near you when you're in Tob. But because it's such a normal thing now to see in the streets, Alhamdulillah, so many of the youth are aspiring to, to, to stick to the Sunnah and to the Quran that it's just, it's Adi, it's no problem at all. I didn't really find much, much um, problems with it. Uh, not only that, it's the problems I did face, they didn't really phase me because it was like, if you don't like it, then that's your own problem. And you know what I mean? I've got enough people, enough friends that, that support me that I don't have to really worry about that kind of um, opposition to what I was doing. And alhamdulillah, you know, it's just, that's what it's about, sticking as a jama'ah. And that way you can strive to be strong. Because at the end of the day, the hadith goes that if you're a group of sheep and one strays, then shaitan will catch that sheep and it will consume it. But other than that, if you stick together as a group and you don't, and, and you know, you're, you're around the good people, you're around people that, that adhere to the sunnah and the Quran, then inshallah ta'ala, you, you stick to the sunnah and the Quran. But as soon as you stray, and you start going with those odd people that start saying this and that about Islam, then it's fine. Like you, you might not even hear them say it, but they're saying it on the sly. So well, once you get into that crowd, they'll pull you out slowly, pull you out slowly until it's just, it starts with those tiniest little things. But it's fine. Like I've seen it happen a lot. I've seen it happen a lot. MashaAllah. So Aki, what advice have you got to born Muslims and also people who like to look into Islam regarding Islam? What advice have you got to them? The best advice I can give, to be honest, is if you're looking at Islam, then first of all, um, don't judge Islam by the people, rather judge the people by Islam. Because there's a lot of people doing a lot of madness that isn't from Islam and the Sunnah, uh, from, the, from the Sunnah and the Quran. So if someone tells you something, always refer it back to the Quran and the Sunnah, because they, they can tell you a hundred and a hundred thousand things which are, uh, which are bid'ah and their, their innovations into the religion. So the most important thing is stick to the Quran, stick to the Sunnah, and you, inshallah, will be okay, inshallah. Uh, Jazakallah khairan. To see more exclusive interviews, go to www.rosatiislam.com. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.